Good afternoon, everyone. This is class three's lecture for week, uh, the week two here on, we're gonna begin our discussion of conservatism by looking at Edmund Burke, who is often referred to as the grandfather of conservatism. And here we're beginning our discussion of conservatism as a form of skepticism. So to get started on this section here, uh, it's important to think about what we are, what we mean when we're talking about conservatism as a form of skepticism, um, because we might be ironic to begin with the idea of conservatism as a form of skepticism, since the Enlightenment itself is grounded on a form of skepticism. And so if conservative political thought reacts to the Enlightenment, then it seems a bit strange to say that it is a form of skepticism using the very tools of the Enlightenment. But the key difference is in the manner and the target of this skepticism. Enlightenment skepticism targeted existing traditions and forms of authority with the goal of liberating human reason uh, to build a more rational and legitimate society, that they were skeptical about our perceived notions about religion and political authority and social hierarchy. Conservative skepticism focuses not on these forms of authority, these traditional forms of authority, but on the authority of reason. Um, it's on the how where should we draw the boundary lines of human reason? And how, how uh, capable is uh, human reason for rebuilding the social and political world in a more rational ways? So conservatism here doesn't defend traditional forms of authority as more rational, but questions whether or not rationality is even something that we should aspire to when discussing politics. And it is in this kind of vein here of questioning whether or not we can have a rationally constructed political society that Burke really is uh, the key fit thinker here. Uh, and, and it is the skepticism that Burke uh, that earns Burke the title of the father of conservatism. And as he writes on page 185 of the Reflections on the Revolution in France, they, and by here he means the, the revolutionaries in France, have much but bad metaphysics, much but bad geometry, much but false proportionate arithmetic. But if it were all as exact as metaphysics, geometry, and arithmetic ought to be, and if their schemes were perfectly consistent in all their parts, it would make only a more fair and slightly vision. It is remarkable that in the great arrangement of mankind, not one reference whatsoever is to be found to anything moral or anything politic. Nothing that relates to the concerns, the actions, the passions, or the interests of men. And so here, what Burke is making this skeptical conservative position uh, because he's concerned with the attempts by the French revolutionaries and others to build more just societies based on abstract principles with no reference to human psychology, human nature, or existing political institution. He's arguing here that politics can't be a science like geometry, where we derive conclusions from first principles, but should be more of a practical science to be guided by rules of thumb and experience rather than metaphysical or geometric laws. So in today's lecture, um, our, our goals are to both describe and evaluate Burke's critique of political radicalism, explain the relationship between skepticism and Burke's argument, what, what is Burke's argument about experience and prudence, and how, why does Burke defend religion and class distinctions? And we're, this lecture is gonna take place over three parts. The first is going to do a little bit of background work to contextualize both Burke and his life and the reflections on the revolution of France themselves. And then we're going to look at two key point, uh, themes in the assigned reading in the reflections. First is Burke's critique of speculative politics uh, or these political metaphysics. And second is his defense of traditional forms of authority. How and why does he defend religious, political and social authority? So let's first take a little bit, a look at uh, Edmund Burke himself. He was born on January 12th, 1729 in Dublin, Ireland, and he died on July 9th, 1797 in Beaconsfield, England. He had a Catholic mother and an Anglican father. Uh, Burke himself, despite being Irish, practiced Anglicanism all of his life. He received education at a Quaker uh, school as a child and enrolled in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, once he reached the age of maturity. He established the College Historical Society there, and that is the oldest undergraduate society in the world. Uh, he graduated in 1748 and went to London to study law, but he gave up on his legal study to travel continental Europe and to pursue, pursue a career as a writer. In 
And his early writings before his political career didn't really concern political issues uh, as much. His first published book was a satire of an essay by Lord Bolingbroke called uh, Letters on the Study and Use of History. And Burke's satire was called A Vindication of Natural Society, a view on the, the miseries and evils arising to mankind. And in this work, Burke imitated the style of Bolingbroke and pushed Bolingbroke's own arguments against revealed religion, so his critiques of religious authority, um, to their more radical extreme, extreme and use what's called in philosophy a uh, reductio ad absurdum, where you take uh, the, your opponent's argument so seriously and push it as far as it possibly can go to show how ridiculous the conclusions would be. And Burke used this critique of Bolingbroke of religion to criticize all existing social institutions to show how absurd the argument was uh, in reality. And this essay, this first book by Burke was actually confusing for many readers because they thought that he was actually taking these arguments seriously uh, and, and, and they did not view this as a satire. He, he gained more popularity based on a, an essay on aesthetics or the theory of beauty called a philosophical inquiry on, of the, sorry, a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful. And he defined the nature of beauty and sublimity and that became popular among continental thinkers like Diderot and Immanuel Kant, who we talked about last class. And eventually he was commissioned in, uh, after this work to write a history of England, uh, but he only ever made it up to 1216 in English history, and then he gave up. And what actually existed wasn't published until after his death. But Burke became, made a name for himself not because of his abstract philosophy, uh, but because he went on to become a member of Parliament in 1729, or sorry, in 1765, uh, where he entered the House of Commons as a, mem uh, as a member of Parliament for Wendover and Buckinghamshire. Uh, he joined Parliament as a member of the Whig Party, which was at the time the Liberal Party uh, in Parliament. And, Bur and Burke gave a number of speeches calling for strict constitutional limits to the king's authority. So. Burke, in many ways, is a liberal uh, in, his, in his political writings. So his conservatism in the reflections comes out of his own kind of commitment to certain forms of liberalism. Uh, a liberalism here meaning not necessarily liberal democracy, uh, but liberal checks on uh, the king's authority. A constitutional monarchy was his ideal liberal polity. In a 1774 speech, he defended the principles of representative democracy, um, but he did argue that representatives are not merely the delegates of the people, but should act as trustees of the popular will. And he writes in the speech, or he said in the speech, quote, their wishes ought to have great weight with him, their opinion, high respect, their business, unremitted attention. It is his duty to sacrifice his, uh, his repose, his pleasures, his satisfaction to theirs, and above all ever in all cases to prefer their interest to his own. But his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any man, or to any set of men living. These he does not derive from your pleasure, no, nor from the law of the Constitution. They are a trust from providence, and for the abuse of which he is deeply answerable. So here his argument is that he does not the rep ideal representative is not someone who just simply like polls his constituents or polls their constituents and votes for whatever their constituents want. Uh, but the ideal representative is, is someone who supplements the judge, the, the, the wisdom of, the, of their rep uh, those who they represent with their own mature judgment. Um, this is known as what's the, the trustee model of representation you might have heard of if you've taken American politics classes, not simply the delegate model. While in Parliament, Burke also expressed support for the American colonies against King George III and called for the repeal of the tea tax. He also believed that peace with the American colonies was preferable to war, to war and pro uh, proposed six reform measures to prevent war with the colonies, including allowing the colonists to elect their own rep representatives in the, t uh, in the Parliament, uh, apologizing for grievances, creating um, a, a means by which the colonies could send their delegates to Parliament, creating an American General Assembly with the power to regulate taxes, uh, and to give needed financial aid to the colonies. Uh, Burke also opposed the slave trade and proposed a bill about preventing slaveholders from sitting in the House of Commons. Uh, so again, you have this kind of consistent defense of broadly liberal ideas throughout his political career.
Uh, and throughout his career, he also sought the impeachment of Warren Hastings, the Governor General of Bengal, uh, and eventually got his uh, Hastings impeach impeached in 1786. And Burke condemned the damage done to India by the East India Company, and that the British had destroyed many local traditions that were beneficial to, to the native uh, of India, the native peoples of India. He personally condemned Hastings for, quote, creating a famine and, quote, a ravenous vulture, and described him as a, quote, a ravenous vulture devouring the carcasses of the dead. Um, and this trial really was the first time in, in the parliament that it highlighted the, the moral questions surrounding British imperialism in public view. And so Burke, throughout his career, shows a deep involvement uh, in politics. He did not approach political questions as a theorist or philosopher, but as a practitioner. And this will be a recurring theme in conservative thought. We'll see it very explicitly in a few weeks in, with uh, Michael Oakeshott, um, conception of conservatism with Leo Strauss's conception of political philosophy and the classical tradition as well. Um, but the idea here is that conservatism begins from politics as it's actually practiced rather than uh, abstract ideas of politics. And he defends a number of liberal causes. So he was not a blind adherent to the absolute monarchy. He's not Thomas Hobbes. He's not, he's not uh, John, uh, Richard Filmer. He's not, um, he's not defending the divine right of kings, uh, absolutely. He, he believes that there is a role for limitations and constitutional limitations on monarchical authority. And so all of this makes the reflections more interesting um, than just kind of like a conservative screed against uh, the French Revolution. So the, rev the reflections, sorry, the reflection on the revolutions in France were published in November 1790. Um, and to put this in uh, some context, we can first look at the context in terms of the French Revolution. As a reminder, the Estates General were called in May 1789 and the National Assembly published the Declarations of the Rights of Man and Citizen in August of 1789. Uh, by the fall of 1789 uh, began, began the appropriation of church property. The royal family was brought to Paris from Versailles and the first assignat was issued. But more importantly, or equally as importantly for Burke uh, in, in, the, in Britain, William Pitt the Younger was the Tory prime minister, so the opposition party to Burke's Whig party, uh, who at the beginning of the year introduced a bill that would empower King George III's son to act as a regent, giving the king, given the king's poor mental health. The king eventually recovered, uh, but this created a controversy, uh, controversy in, um, with, for Burke, uh, uh, as we'll see, uh, a controversy within the Whig party about whether or not they would support William Pitt uh, and, the Regen and this Regency Act. And there was also a more, more pressing controversy uh, uh, called the Revolution Controversy, in which Richard Price gave a sermon to the London Revolution Society in 1790, praising the French Revolution and arguing that the re revolution was the natural continuation of the glorious revolution of 1688 in England, which uh, brought uh, Queen, Queen Mary and King William of Orange to the throne in a bloodless revolution that greatly empowered Parliament's uh, authority uh, with respect to the monarchy. So Burke himself uh, was began the reflections as a response to a letter by Charles Dupont in 1789, who wrote to Burke um, asking him his opinion of the French Revolution. And by 1790, when Burke actually sat down to write the reflections, he was fairly isolated in his own party, partially because of the Hastings impeachment and partially because the majority of the Whigs supported the Regency Act of 1789. And so, he uses the revolution controversy, uh, Richard Price's sermon um, about how the French Revolution is the natural um, heir to the glorious revolution in England, as a um, launching off point to critique the French Revolution. And so the reflections were as much a commentary on French politics as a critique of certain pol political currents in Great Britain and in the Whig Party and it's also an attempt by Burke to regain public favor and popularity himself. And so it's really important as we're looking closely in section at some of the specific passages in this text that we should read the reflections as a work of rhetoric and political commentary rather than a straightforward philosophical treatise. This isn't like Plato's Republic or um, Hobbes' Leviathan. Um, that This is very much intended to be read by the, by the public. So we're gonna talk about the reflections in just a second here, but this is a good time if you need to pause this lecture, get a glass of water, use the restroom, or take a break and come back to it. <laughs> 
The first main line of argument that I want to explore in the reflections is Burke's critique of grounding politics on what he calls throughout the piece speculative principles. And as he writes on, uh, early in the reflections on page eight, he says he quote, loves a manly moral regulated liberty as well as any gentleman of that society. So his critique of the revolution is not from the perspective of an autocrat. He's not defending the absolute monarchy. He's not in principle opposed to the enlightenment values of freedom and autonomy, but later on the same page, uh, same page eight here, he, he argues that circumstances give in reality to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effort, or sorry, its discriminating effect. The circumstances are what render every civil and political scheme beneficial or noxious to mankind. Abstractly speak, speaking, excuse me, government as well as liberty is good. But he concludes, am I to congratulate a highwayman and a murderer who broke prison upon the recovery of his natural rights? And what he's saying here is that there's the, the, the critique of the Enlightenment project behind the Revol French Revolution is that it abstracts away from the realities and defends itself in terms of broad values everyone supports in the abstract, like liberty. Um, but these, how these values are actually practiced in institutionalized matters. We can't evaluate whether values such as liberty, equality, rationality, fraternity are good or bad outside of how they are realized in political context, in particular contexts, right? Liberty is good unless it's the liberty of, uh, in, Burke's, in Burke's example, of an escaped murderer who recovers their freedom by breaking uh, free of prison. Like, is that the same type of good liberty? And and this first argument here is about this, this, this abstraction from specific contexts also leads to his second critique, and that is that the revolution is not only based on abstract principles that are meaningless in, in their abstraction, but that it's these principles are based on this idea of perfection. There's a kind of utopian promise of the French Revolution, that if we can build a society based on rational principles, um, that we will resolve all human uh, problems, that we're not going to have any starvation, we're not going to have any, um, we're not going to have any, any human suffering, it's, uh, or any form of, of issue here. Um, and, and, but he notes on page 61 that this creates an insatiable, dem insatiable demand. He writes that by having a right to everything, they want everything. And so he cautions uh, that society requires not only that the passions of individuals be subjected, but that even in the mass and the body of individuals, the inclinations of men should be frequently thwarted, their will controlled, their passions brought into subjection. That politics shouldn't be about promising people everything. That once you start promising people perfection, they're always going to want more. They're always going to find something else that's wrong in the society requiring another revolution to uh, fix this. And this is a theme that we'll also see next week in Hayek. So why is this so? Uh, for Burke, the revolutionaries in France are making a fundamental mistake about human nature. For the revolutionaries, once the correct social and political institutions are created and the corrupt irrational ones like the monarchy and the church are destroyed, humanity's natural goodness will reveal itself. Burke has a much more complex view of human nature, however. Human beings are neither absolutely good nor absolutely bad, but they're shaped by their context and circumstances. Therefore, where the revolutionaries view rights as extremes, these rights that can never be violated at all, Burke contends on page 63 that the rights of men are a sort of middle, uh, are in the sort of middle incapable of definition, but not impossible to be discerned. The rights of men in government are their advantages, and there are often balances between differences of good and uh, sorry, differences of good and compromises sometimes between good and evil, sometimes between evil and evil. So politics is often a balancing act because we, there are people aren't fully good, they're not fully evil, but they're trying to do the best they can. And often these abstract rights, when you try to put them in practice, you, they come into conflict with each other. They can't actually be realized perfectly. Uh, perfect equality would be great, but how are we going to have enough material, plant, material resources to provide perfect equality? How, what do we do when we have scarcity? Uh, and these are the types of questions that Burke is concerned with. So politics isn't something that we can resolve. Uh, political questions can't be resolved through appeals to absolute moral principles, but it's a, it's a realm of disagreement and compromise. The mistake of the revolutionaries is forgetting these realities of politics and believing that politics is just another philosophical exercise, that once we derive the correct philosophical principles, that we'll be able to easily resolve all the political questions. And this creates problems for Burke. Uh, the importance of context and the impossibility of perfection are both reasons why um, the revolution is necessarily going to fail on its promises. Uh, but he also thinks that this type of utopian thinking is dangerous. 
And he talk, talks about this in terms of what he calls political metaphysics, this attempt to ground uh, politics on these abstract philosophical principles of reason, liberty, and equality, rather than on history or political context. And so for Burke, the utopian project of the revolution will not end until it completely destroys the existing society, and it will do, the, do so with ruthless cruelty. Uh, after all, if you're promising heaven on earth, you can justify almost any amount of violence and sacrifice in order to achieve it. And so even though Burke is writing in 1790, three years before the execution of, of, of King Louis and Queen Marie Antoinette and the reign of terror, he anticipates that this is where the revolution is going to end up. On page 79, he, he writes that on the scheme of this barbarous philosophy, which is the offspring of cold hearts and muddy understandings, and which is void of solid wisdom. It is destitute of all taste and elegance. Laws are to be supported only by their own terrors, and by concern which e with which each individual may find in them from his own private speculation, or can spare them from his own private interests. In the groves of their academy, at the end of every visto, you see nothing but the gallows. Now, of course, Burke did not anticipate the guillotine, um, but the same idea is here. Once we reduce political obligations and obedience to individual rational volition, this kind of Rousseauian idea that all of us have to rationally justify the existing political order or we're free to dissolve it, then there isn't really a political order at all. As soon as the individual decides it's no longer in their own interest to follow the law, they'll break it. And these laws, once they're stripped of what Burke calls later all pleasing illusions which make power gentle and obedience liberal. They can only be subordinated by coercion and violence. Uh, this idea, this, again, this Rousseauian idea of forcing the people to be free by forcing their obedience. And then he writes later on page 79 that on this scheme of things, the king is but a man, a queen is but a woman, a woman is but an animal, and an animal is not of the highest order. Regicide and parricide and sacrilege are but fictions of superstition, corrupting jurisprudence by destroying its simplicity. The murder of a king or a queen or a bishop or a father are only common homicide, and that the people by any chance or in any way gainers by it, a sort of homicide that is the most pardonable and into which we ought not make too severe a scrutiny. That is, once we have decided that the monarchy is this superstition and that the king is nothing more than a man, we can just kill the king. And if killing the king benefits the people, then not only is killing the king not all that bad, but it might even be a good thing. And so once we've decided that all of these institutions are standing in the way of a rational and perfect society, anything and everything can be justified to reach that paradise. Such way of thinking not only cannot provide a solid foundation for politics, um, but as the continual coups and counter coups of the French Revolution bore out, but it's always going to end in violence, bloodshed, and tyranny. And as he writes on page 101 of the Reflections, once we transform the laws of obedience and obligations from laws of necessity that bind every member of the nation to each other to a voluntary social contract that each person individually assents or rejects, he writes that, quote, the law is broken, nature is disobeyed, and the rebellious are outlawed, cast forth and exiled from this world of reason and order, of peace and virtue, and of fruitful penitence uh, in, in, into the antagonist world of madness, discord, vice, confusion, and unavailing sorrow. That once we start questioning and once we start overthrowing the, 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 these traditional forms of authority, we've opened the floodgates to the destruction of all society. We're going to talk about how traditional forms of authority, traditional forms of knowledge, uh, provide a more stable foundation in just a second. But this is a good time if you need to pause this lecture, take a break, get a snack, uh, go for a walk, feed your dog, whatever you need to do. Uh, this is a great time to take, pause the lecture. So against the Enlightenment project of perfecting human society through the application of rational principles to politics, Burke's thinks, uh, tries to conserve existing political institutions, um, but also existing cultural beliefs, practices, and social norms. However, his defense is fairly nuanced. His argument is not so much that these traditional forms of authority are correct in any sort of philosophical or metaphysical sense, but that they are practically useful in preserving political order and social stability. He's not making, he doesn't at any point in the reflections make an, uh, an argument about like, here are the philosophical principles that justify the monarchy or justify the church. He doesn't go make a theological defense of the Catholic church, but he's much more interested in how, what role these institutions play in preserving society. 
And, and crucially for him, that prudence and prejudice is, is and, and are key to managing progress. So what does he mean by this? And prudence, he argues throughout the reflections, is the key principle that should animate political life. As he writes on page 62, the science of constructing a commonwealth or renovating it or reforming it is like every other experimental science, not to be taught a priori. Nor is it a short experience that can instruct us in the practical science because the real effects of our moral causes are not always immediate. So for Burke, it's best to be cautious in politics because the effects of what seem to be obviously good ideas and good reforms and proposals can't always be discerned. And we can't know what all the effects are going to be purely by their a priori principles because once we enter in the real world, we lose control of all of the effects of all of these actions. So we should only work to change existing institutions when we have a preponderance of experiential evidence that this is a good idea. And this isn't a defense of the monarchy or the church as divinely ordained, uh, but an argument that their alternatives might be worse. And so in, in a passage that is probably striking for you on page 90, he defends prejudices. And here we should be thinking of prejudices not as biases against particular people, but as preconceived opinions, uh, more like beliefs that we've been habited, habituated to. So our kind of cultural norms and social beliefs. And these are valuable not because they're right, but because they're useful. He writes that prejudice, this is on page 90, is a ready application uh, in an emergency as it previously engages the mind in a steady course of wisdom and virtue and does not leave the man hesitating in the moment of decision, skeptical, puzzled, or unresolved. Prejudice renders man's virtue his habit and not a series of unconnected acts. Through, our, through just prejudice, his duty becomes part of his nature. That if we are constantly subjecting every single one of our beliefs to rational scrutiny, and this is the enlightenment ideal, then we're never able to actually make decisions. In moments of crisis or emergency, we, don't have, we, we do not rely on our rational principles, but our unthinking habits and custom. And for Burke, these customs and prejudices should be preserved and cultivated with an eye towards virtue, rather than rejected as superstitions. They can be useful tools to push people to a more just and maintain the integrity of the social order. And, but Burke does not reject all progress. His conservatism, like all conservatism, is not a rejection of stay, change and a defense of the unchanging present or past, but he calls for a slow but well-sustained progress. The effect of each step is watched. The good or ill success of the first gives light to us in the second, and so from light to light we are conducted from, with safety through the whole series. The change is inevitable, Burke agrees, but it must be managed prudently and with practical reasoning, not abstract philosophy. And so to that end, he defends religion, social hierarchy, and traditions as ways to help manage the, this change. So let's think about these in a little bit more detail before we wrap up. Religious institutions play a really important role in this. As you read the reflections, see if you can find any passages where Burke defends the Catholic Church on theological grounds. I'll doubt you'll find any, but if you do, bring them to class and prove me wrong. Instead, he emphasizes the practical benefits of religion. Religious institutions bind human beings to projects and ideas and, and communities that are bigger than themselves, to tra traditions and beliefs that go back centuries. And they also, as he writes on pages 96 and 97, invest political authority with a sense of wholesome awe. This elevates the leaders of communities closer to the divine. And for Burke, this does two things. First, for the ruled, for the people, it makes the people less likely to question the law as they believe it to be divinely sanctioned or inspired. And again, Burke is not interested in the reality of this idea. He's not actually making the claim that the law is divinely inspired, but that the people believe that it is so. Once the law becomes something that can be rationally criticized and subjected to every individual's whim, it no longer can prevent the descent of a political community into chaos. And second, for the rulers, the religion adds a sense of weight and gravity to their rule. They're not ruling for themselves, but they're ruling on behalf of God for the benefit of the people. Burke writes on page 97 that all persons possessing any portion of power ought to be strongly and awfully impressed with the idea that they act in trust and that they account for their conduct in that trust to that one great master, author, and founder of society. So they, religious principles invest a sense of responsibility among the rulers to the people, just as it creates bonds of obligation among the people to the ruler. Throughout the reflections, Burke frequently and vehemently critiques the revolution's attempt to transform France into a Republican democracy. He rejects the idea that the common people can exercise the type of sober and prudent wisdom that he believes statesmanship requires. 
And he warns that the revolution replaces, risks replacing the despotism of the monarchy with the despotism of the multitude. Invoking the idea of the tyranny of the majority, he warns that the oppression of the minority, this is a quote, will extend to far greater numbers and will be carried through with much greater fury than can almost ever be apprehended from the dominion of a single scepter. A monarchy, but one bound by laws and representative institutions such as Burke's own Britain, uh, can better balance this despotism of absolutism and the despotism of mob rule. And so who should be these representatives? Again, Burke rejects the idea that any ordinary person should be empowered to public office, that anyone can just serve in this, these representative assemblies that check the power of the monarchy. A co the common people, especially if they are poor in Burke's logic, are likely to fall prey to the desire to seize property and distribute it to, to the masses. But in doing so, Burke cautions on page 52, they would only end up giving everyone a small amount but, and rob the nation of its sources of wealth. Instead, he argues that only those who are, quote, possessors of family wealth and hereditary distinction should be entrusted to make these decisions on regarding public property and the finances of the society. Being secure in their own property, Burke's argument goes, they're going to be less likely to be manipulated by demagogue, demagogues and populists and less likely to sacrifice long-term financial stability for short-term gains. Thus, he writes on page 53 that some decent regulated preeminence, some preference, not exclusive appropriation given to Burke is neither unnatural nor unjust nor unpolitic. So it is okay to give greater political authority and social esteem to the wealthy, to the people of, to people, the, the aristocracy, to the, the, the wealthy and powerful families, because they, in Burke's logic, are less likely to need to try to redistribute all of the, uh, the wealth of the nation in foolish, in foolish ways. That they're more likely, because they come from these long lines of wealthy families, to think about the long-term financial stability of the society. Finally, uh, Burke defends history, not as a source of correct answers, but as, quote, a great volume that is unrolled for our instruction, drawing the materials of future wisdom from the past uh, errors and firmer infirmities of mankind, and that's on page 145. Then crucially for Burke, history teaches us that, quote, the miseries brought about the world by pride, ambition, avarice, revenge, lust, sedition, hypocrisy, ungoverned zeal, and all the train of disorderly appetites, uh, and so if we study history for Burke, we realize that attempts to transform human, the human condition, uh, try to build a heaven on earth, are both likely to fail and also likely to be perverted by individual pride and greed and the lust for power. So Burke continues this logic on page 146 and argues that getting rid of traditional forms of, of authority, religious beliefs, legal systems, and social practices doesn't actually solve the, any of the problems that, that exist in them. Abolishing the monarchy doesn't save the political community from the abuses of power, as the same evils in human nature that lead to corruption and abuse will take a new form, like a ghost, he writes on page 146, haunting our steps as we think we are exercising all of the intolerant superstitions of the past that we can't just simply um, rewrite history and get rid of the get rid of the injustices of the, uh, uh, the past by kind of starting a blank turning over a blank page and starting from scratch that unless we that that these evils and corruptions and, and tendencies to abuse power that are kind of inherent in human nature aren't going to go away just because we got rid of the church and the monarchy uh, just because we got rid of some superstitious social customs that they're still going to be there and they're just going to find new forms Oops. Uh, so this has obviously been a very schematic overview of some of the key themes in Burke's reflections. And I hope that we'll discuss some of these passages and others in more detail during our discussion sections. So I'm going to close with some, a few questions to think about before section. If you haven't done the reading yet, keep these ideas in mind as you do so. And if you have done the reading, think through these before coming to, uh, to, to your discussion section. So what are some other examples of traditional institutions that Burke defends in the reflections? What rhetorical devices, arguments, and appeals does he make? Do you find them persuasive or not? How might Burke's arguments be applied to contemporary political debates and issues? For whom might Burke's argument be particularly persuasive? And by this, I mean who stands to gain and who stands to lose from preserving these traditional uh, forms of political authority? What might be motivating Burke's argument? What interests and goals might the text be trying to achieve? 
So that's going to wrap up this introductory lecture for our, our discussion of Burke's Re Reflections on the Revolution in France. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all in discussion sections. Again, if you're discussion leaders, make sure that you have your brief five-minute kind of presentations. You don't, need, you don't need to have a formal PowerPoint presentation, but you're more than welcome to if you would like. If you'd like to put particular passages on the board that you wanted to talk about, you can also just come prepared with a kind of a uh, application to something that you saw in the news or in the world today that reminded you of, Bur of something in Burke's text and talk about that as a way to get our discussion started. Uh, we'll see you in section, as always, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, you feel free to email me or stop by in office hours. I will see you on either Monday or Wednesday for discussion section. Uh, enjoy, take care, and I will see you then.